This is Jeremy Bassetti, and you're listening to Travel Writing World, a podcast featuring interviews with travel writers about their work and about the business and craft of travel writing. You can find the episode show notes, free travel writing resources, and much more at travelwritingworld.com. Hello, everyone. This is episode 61 of the Travel Writing World podcast. Few conversations about Patrick Lee Fermer's book, A Time of Gifts, happen without mentioning Lori Lee's As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. Lee's book, also an account of a European walk, was published before Patty's book. They're similar, but they're <laughs> quite different. So on today's episode, Jessica Vincent joins me to talk about Lori Lee and his book. We also talk about gender representations in the book and the book's enduring appeal. All of that's coming up in the interview, but I want to hear from you. Have you read Lori Lee's book? And what are your thoughts? Please leave a comment on the show notes. Go to TravelWritingWorld.com and find the episode. In travel writing news, the Wainwright long list was announced last month, and I think their shortlist uh, announcement is due sometime in early August. I know the Wainwright Prize is one that celebrates nature writing, but there there is an overlap between nature writing and travel writing. I, I think on the the long list there are some titles uh, that illustrate this overlap, like uh, Anita Sati's "I Belong Here" and uh, Cal Flynn's "Islands of Abandonment." We're we are rooting for these travel adjacent titles. Lucy Nathan of Book Brunch notes that Manisha Rajesh just sold the rights to her forthcoming book tentatively called Midnight Express, a book about sleeper trains and what she reports as a major deal. Again, another indicator that the the market for travel books is healthy, but also another illustration of how niching down and uh, you know focusing on a particular subject like trains in this case uh, can be helpful. More generally, uh, industry analyst Jane Friedman reports that sales of books in all categories have grown uh, some 20% year to date uh, with you know, strong backlist sales in some categories. Um, the broader travel category, as we all know, saw like a major steep decline last year. But I'm speculating that guidebook sales made that number tank and that travel literature is also enjoying, you know, the rising tide like the other uh, categories. Hopefully the book market will continue to be healthy, but I doubt these uh, massive increases will will sustain in the long term. And lastly, William Dalrymple has a collection of photographs in Grosvenor Gallery in London running through July, I believe. So if you're in the area, you might want to check that out. In my personal update, uh, again, not much to report. Uh, I posted an article on TravelWritingWorld.com about 10 subgenres of the travel book. Uh, I'm not sure I like the, the, the term subgenres. I don't think it's completely accurate here. Uh, I think it will do, you know, when I say subgenres, I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about uh, like flavors or kind of organizational approaches to travel books. But um, I guess subgenres works in this case. Anyway, check that out. Um, I also published a binaural field recording of a park in the Dominican Republic. There's also a video that I published along with it on YouTube. So if you want to check that out and listen to some ambient soundscapes, uh, you can listen and watch the video at jeremybassetti.com. So it was great to hear from everyone over the last few weeks. Gitanjali writes, you're my unending resource for great travel books to keep us going until we can head out for our own adventures. Thanks for the comment, Gitanjali. We also got a couple of new five-star reviews. They're, they're the kinds without the comments, which fine, fine, fine. We'll take what we can get, but we like to read the comments uh, on the show. So please leave a review if you can and uh, leave a comment. I'll read it on the air. We also got a new patron. Thanks to Heinrich for supporting the podcast. So thanks for reaching out, everyone, and for supporting the show. If you want to get in touch, you can tweet me at Jeremy Bassetti, or you can leave a comment on the show at TravelWritingWorld.com and find the episode. While the show is free, it ain't cheap, so please consider telling your friends about the show, leaving a review on the Apple Podcast app or whichever podcasting app you use, or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month, less than a cup of coffee, at TravelWritingWorld.com slash support. So now, here is the interview. Well, welcome to the podcast, Jess. 
Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. So from time to time, I invite writers to talk about so-called classic travel books. And when I invited you, you suggested that we talk about Lori Lee's travel memoir, As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. Um, and I'm excited to talk with you about this book. But before we do that, um, I was wondering if you could just give us a little uh, idea about who you are and, and, and what do you do? Yeah, so I am a travel journalist. I work with publications like National Geographic, BBC Travel, The Telegraph, The Independent, um, and some others. Uh, Pre-COVID, I'd spent the last <laughs> three years living out of a backpack, traveling through Central and South America, Europe, and a little bit of um, Africa as well. Um, so it was really through traveling full time that I, I fell into this career of freelance travel writing. And now I'm based in the UK while we wait out this pandemic. Um, and I haven't been able to travel very much as I used to, but um, my work is still very much focused on, on telling long form, investigative travel stories, you know, that teach us something about a place, um, a culture or community that is rarely reported in mainstream media. So that includes like lesser known or disappearing traditions um, or profiling projects and people who are doing incredible things um, around the world. So yeah, that, so, that's me. So not the uh, 10 best tequila drinks on the beach. <laughs> Well, I do love tequila, but no, I try. I mean, we all, we've all done those lists and uh -huh. you know, they pay the bills, but um, yeah, I really love, really love those kind of mm. long, um, in-depth, meaty travel stories if I can get them. Yeah. But you've been keeping yourself bu uh, busy. Uh, you have this wonderful Instagram live series where you interview other creative people in the travel space. So photographers and other travel writers, for example. Um, tell us a little bit about this before we talk about the book. Like, what is your username there and what are the details about your Instagram live talks? Yeah. So I started, we're now on the 18th episode this yesterday. I just recorded the 18th episode. Um, and it really just started as a way to kind of give aspiring writers an insight in, into the industry, but also as a way to connect, um, with colleagues and stay connected over, over COVID. Um, so yeah, they, they go live every week, every Wednesday at 6 PM. Uh, and my Instagram account is no matter travel dot travel. Uh, so all you have to do is just, um, click on my profile at 6 PM. We'll be there live. And we also upload, uh, those lives onto IGTV. So you can catch up at any point. And we've had some incredible guests. We've had you know, Sebastian Modak, the 52 places traveler for the New York times. Uh, we've had the editor at national geographic traveler sharing tips on how to pitch to Nat Geo. So we've had a real, a real That's range great. of people. So I'd, I'd highly recommend you can catch up on all the episodes on my Instagram account. And you said no matter with an A, no matter travel. Yeah, no oh. matter travel. That's okay. it. N O M A D A dot travel. Okay. And you've also been keeping yourself busy by putting together a or working with other organizations like the British Guild of, of Travel Writers to put together a Best British Travel Writing of the 21st Century Anthology. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes. And first of all, congrats on saying that right. <laughs> the, the title is very, it's, it's a bit of a wordy title. Yes. So um, we've got uh, an anthology coming out in March 2022. It's going to be a collection of 25 travel stories published in UK media in the last 20 years. So a huge time frame. Um, it's a celebration of travel, a celebration of uh, travel writing as, as a craft, especially during this time where uh, lots of travel writers haven't had any work. Um, so this is really kind of celebrating uh, that travel writing as, um, as as a craft. So yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be published in March 2022, and we're currently looking for submissions, so stories to include in the in the book. Uh, you don't have to be British to, to submit your work. Your work just has to have been published in UK media in the last 20 years. So uh, if you want more information about that, we're, we're um, accepting submissions right now, right up until the 14th of June. And all the information you need to submit is on the website. It's called bestbritishtravelwriting.com. Okay. And 
this is in association with the British Guild of Travel Writers, right? Yeah, so okay. it's being published by uh, Summersdale Publishers. It's a UK um, publishing house, and it's uh, in partnership with the British Guild of Travel Writers, okay. um, which is a community of over 300 uh, travel writers, photographers in the UK, um, who or who write for UK media. So they, um, they're they on board with the project and they're supporting us very kindly. Um, and if you are a travel writer who writes for, for UK media, I would recommend go and check out the BGTW. It's a great community. Mm-hmm. And they, they do have some, uh, as just a side note, they do have some great uh, kind of like professional development type uh, webinars on Zoom, say, that they do. Is avail- that they're available to non-members for a very small fee, but those have been very kind of stimulating um, and, and they're great. They're just all around great. Yeah, they're, they're great. I think they're under £10, so really, mm. really affordable and on, on lots of different topics. Yeah. Good. So now that we got all of that out of the way, uh, let's get into the book. Uh, you recommended that we speak about Lori Lee's As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning, which is also kind of a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> But it sounds Let's nice. Let's call it As I Walked Out. <laughs> as I Walked Out. Okay. Um, so why did you suggest that we talk about this book? Yeah, I, it's actually, I'm surprised because that, not that I suggested it, but actually I hadn't read As I Walked Out until last year, uh-huh. um, which as a travel writer, I think people might be surprised because it's such such a huge, a huge book. And I, I was aware of Laurie Lee. Um, I've been aware of him for a long time because um, in the UK, I think every school library in the UK, <clears throat> excuse me, has um, Cider with Rosie, a copy of mm-hmm. his first um, autobiographical book. Because um, as I walked out, was the second in that in that series of three autobiographical books. So, um, so I, I was aware of his work at quite an quite a young age. Um, but I didn't actually read as I walked out until last year when I was back home at my mum's house in Spain and and she'd got a copy for her birthday. And as soon as she'd finished, um, obviously I recognised the name and um, she told me briefly it's about someone who walks, he he walks through through Spain. Mm -hmm. And obviously um, I... I was in Spain at the time. I'm half Spanish, um, and that that was a big draw to me. So I read it cover to cover, and and I absolutely loved it. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned that his earlier book, um, Cider with Rosie, is in all of the libraries of of schools. And as I read this book, what struck me was that it seemed to be like a coming of age story. You know, mm-hmm. something that I think a uh, a young adult, uh, especially a young male adult, um, <laughs> we can talk about <laughs> that, <laughs> yes. that, that, but um, it seems like a, a good story for, you know, a young adult, like trying to figure out what, what he or she wants to do in life, you know, um, it has that kind of, uh, I guess, naivety or this kind of youthful quality to uh, about it that just, you know, we're getting a little bit older, but pulls us back to our, <laughs> our youth in some way. I thought it was uh, very good uh, on that front. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Obviously, Cider with Rosie is, is I mean, it is just childhood, isn't it? It's yeah. is so clever the way he, he, te- he kind of speaks from a child's um, through a child's eyes. Um, whereas this one, yeah, it's more of a coming of age book. Um, and you can definitely, I mean, the way he walks out of, even though he loves his home, this is what Laurie Lee in the UK is known for the guy who kind of immortalized the, um, the British countryside, the English countryside. Um, but then here he is in his, in, as I walked out, um, this young man um, looking for adventure and wanting to walk away from this beautiful home that he'd grew up in and that he loves. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of young people, that's why it still resonates with young people now. And it resonated with me because it's got that sense of wanting to break away from your roots and wanting to explore Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely know what you mean. Which, which is very interesting because 
The story happens in 1934, and this isn't published until 1969, I believe. And mm. just like his earlier book, which is from a younger period in his life or an earlier period in his life, it was also published, you know, many, many decades after that. So it's interesting that he's able to to capture the spirit of youth uh, so well, even in his later years. Yeah, I mean, it's such a skill, and I think I think his his poetry background mm-hmm. really helps him with that because he can just the way the language he uses, he can really just it, it's almost like he is there and that's why he's such a great travel writer as well because he can describe the most minute of details details that most of us wouldn't even notice and and he does it just with ease and I mean I'm not sure how much sometimes I read I read through this and I go no way did you remember this this is no (laughs) chance um but it, it doesn't really matter does it the point is is that he he makes us feel like we're there and he struck and he strikes a chord with with young people and people of all ages actually um because he touches on those very human emotions that even if he wasn't even if he's not being truthful at all point at all times if his memory isn't serving serving him well as well as it as well as he might want us to think uh-huh. it it's a powerful piece of writing because he's so good at describing how he feels, what he sees. And and that's the power of this book, I think. Mm -hmm. If I'm remembering it correctly, uh, I think Dervila Murphy uh, in a, I guess, a review of the book or she was writing about the book. I'm going to scratch this out (laughs) out if it's completely (laughs) false, but um, I think she was reviewing the book and she brings this up. She says, it doesn't matter if, you know, half of what he said isn't true because it's such a kind of powerful and beautiful beautifully written book There's- oh, really? i haven't actually read that that sounds like i just copied her words <laughs> i haven't actually read that okay that's yeah. that's really interesting yeah i mean it's one of the perennial i guess conversations in in travel writing especially um kind of the longer form book side of travel writing um to mm. to what extent is all of this really 100 percent true and does that even matter if kind of the spirit of the the topic is 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 true, right? Yeah, yeah, and I I honestly am of obviously you there's a point if you're writing travel there has to be an element of truth, of course you mm-hmm. can't just lie through your teeth. Um, but uh, me personally, I think you are also you are also a writer uh, and as a writer, you, you, you are allowed to be creative. You are a kind of artist or we think we're artists. We like to, we like to act as if we're artists. So there is an element of creativity there. And without that creativity, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be um, as exciting to read, I think. And sometimes you need that creativity in order to help people visualize mm-hmm. what you're seeing and what you're feeling. Yeah, I agree. You'd mentioned that he's from the uh, countryside, the British countryside, and uh, he's from a place that many Americans uh, don't just kind of run of the mill tourist Americans like me, we wouldn't necessarily know about. Like he's from Cotswold. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to butcher this because it, 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 you pronounce it not as it is read or as it's written, but uh, Gloucestershire. He's, Gloucestershire. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> all right. He's from Gloucestershire and Cotswold. And in 1934, when he's 19, he kind of sets off to London on foot with a fiddle. And as you mentioned, travels through Spain from coast to coast. Um, but can you give us a sense of uh, what Cotswold is like? What is Gloucestershire like? What is this region like? And um, just to contextualize it for, for people who may not know anything about it. Yeah, so the Cotswolds is a protected area in mm. the southeast of England. It covers, I think, six counties. Um, it's an official area of outstanding natural beauty. So that's um, that's the, the equivalent of, of a national park in the in the US. You know, it'd okay. be um, it's it's officially protected, and I think it's been protected for fifty years. And actually, I read somewhere that the Laurie Lee. 
and his family have a lot to do with that because they were very passionate about ensuring that the Cotswolds was protected and kept in 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 the way that that he describes it. You know, because he could see that with with cars um, being invented and being used more in the 30s and 40s, um, that that these beautiful villages in England were going to change. So. It, and and it, to some extent it has worked because uh, the Cotswolds is everything, or at least those protected parts is everything that Laurie Lee describes um, more so in Insider with Rosie. It's you know rolling green hills dotted with sheep and mm-hmm. clusters of those very famous honey-coloured stone houses and medieval churches and tiny cosy pubs serving craft ales, you know, and steak and kidney pie. Um, <laughs> so during... Lee's childhood, the Cotswolds was just the Cotswolds. They were just little villages, little chains of villages, sleepy, sleepy rural villages. Um, but now it's, it's probably one of the most visited areas out, outside of London. They're hugely, hugely popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure with US tourists, when the American tourists, when they come, they come over, they love, they love the Cotswolds. Mm. I need a, I need a visit there. I, I mean, yeah. I guess first time travelers to London or to, to to Britain would probably hit up one of the capital cities. And then if they're adventurous, they might kind of go off into the countryside. But I guess that's where, you know, the, the magic happens. <clears throat> People love to visit Paris, but as soon as they go outside of Paris, for example, they, you know, learn another side of, of the country and, and fall in love with it in ways that they weren't expecting. So it does sound very rural and, uh, and kind of like a wonderful place, but if you loved it so much, like why did he want to leave? Did, did you get a sense of why he wanted to leave to just leave the area? Do you, do we know why he left? Hmm. That's, that's an interesting question. I think I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just got the sense just reading the book. Mm-hmm. I mean, without without taking in sure. um, any kind of other context, just focusing on what you get from the book. For me, he was just a nineteen year old <laughs> boy who had lived all his life in this tiny village, um, and he did love his home. We know that it was it was he, he has fond memories mm-hmm. of his childhood, as you say. But it gets to the point, and I think there's a line at the beginning, and I can't rem- I can't remember it off by heart. I haven't written it down, but it's something along the lines along the lines of that he felt that the streets were almost suffocating him. Oh, right. At that point, mm-hmm. do you do you remember that? I yeah. think there was something about they just felt they were they were narrowing in on him, and yeah. the way he describes it is beautiful. So I'm not going to try and yeah. and um, paraphrase, but it was basically that that he feels suffocated and he sees that you know um when the when the girls look at him marry me marry me huh they say marry me settle down yeah Yeah, marry me settle down exactly exactly um and he doesn't want that he's not ready he's obviously got this adventurous spirit in him that um obviously lots of us travel writers travelers um can relate to where Mm -hmm. you're getting to an age where people have certain expectations of you and as a as a kind of product of that, you want to rebel and you want to walk away and see see what lies beyond beyond the village walls. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I know exactly what part of the book that you're talking about because I'd I'd circled it um, just because you're right. It's just beautifully beautifully written, but kind of resonating in some way. I came I come from a a, a small town, so it kind of resonated mm-hmm. with me in, 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 a, in a special way but he was he was talking about the suffocating hills I guess and he'd mentioned walking down a street and as you said I'm gonna butcher this I'm not gonna you know re- <laughs> recount it as beautifully as he writes it but something about walking on a road to London suffocated by the hills that has something to do with that you know f- the forces of tradition are yes. forcing people to walk down the street to London and to leave the countryside. So I think here he's talking about modernity, the promise of big city life, of, of uh, uh, I don't know, of action, of of adventure in a big city. I think that's the fuck. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that was gonna, that's the force uh, that that pushes him out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was it. That was it. I wish I'd written the quote down, but 
um yeah that that's exactly it he's he's pushed out by by the pressures of of what's expected of him i think okay i found it can i read it yeah yeah okay he says um I was propelled, of course, by the traditional forces that had sent many generations along this road, by the small tight valley closing in around me, stifling the breath with its mossy mouth, the cottage walls narrowing like the arms of an iron maiden, the lo- local girls whispering, marry and settle down. That's exactly, yeah, that's what, that's what I remembered. And it's, it's, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because this is, this is someone in the 1930s writing this, and although you know, we're, we're in a very different time now, but it's kind of the same. There's still the same expectations now of once you reach a certain age, it might not be 19 anymore, but let's say 30 now is kind of that mm-hmm. age where as soon as you start approaching 30, people start looking at you, maybe not <coughs> people shouting in the street going, marry me, <laughs> as, as Laurie apparently, <laughs> apparently had in the streets, all the girls falling at his feet. But, um, but it certainly is, you know, you've got grandparents and parents turning to you and sure. saying, hey, when are you going to marry? And that, that certainly for some of us makes us want to run away or, or walk walk across Spain. <laughs> and walk across Spain, he does. Um, after a brief interlude in London, he stays there for, I think, about a year. Um, and he meets a girl named, one of his one of his many girlfriends, uh, a girl named <laughs> Cleo, who is half American or Latin American. And she's this kind of uh, evangelist for the communists, I think. And he works in London as a construction worker for a year. Mm. Yes, he does. He does. And that's, that's an interesting, an interesting part because some of, some of the people he meets there as well is uh, in the construction workers. I think he said someone had, was a murderer or a rapist Mm -hmm. or, and he just kind of comments like it's nothing, you know, he just seems to be able to blend in into any group or community that he puts that he puts himself into, and I think in London that's the first time uh, where we see that. But he he carries that through all through Spain, where he can drop in in and find work somehow, right. and and just just immerse himself into any kind of any kind of group of people. And, yeah. and I think that's that's a real a real skill. Well, I think it's also. And this is just a speculation, but I think it's a, a function of his class. I mean, he comes from a fairly rural area, I, I would assume, uh, not very well to do. Um, and he mm-hmm. he can get on with, you know, the down and out, the the people like him, the the, the poor. Um, he, he meets up with a guy called Alf, who is a professional hobo, I guess, right? And <laughs> yeah. he rubs shoulders with these uh, people quite effortlessly effortlessly and because he's a poet and because he's literate and and very sharp and apparently good looking he also can get on with the the well to do and i don't know like I, I have this suspicion that um more i guess rich writers or or someone so patrick lee firmer another travel writer is essentially doing the same thing that he did um he goes through mainland Europe about the same time and publishes the book, his book, A Time of Gifts, a few years after Laurie Lee does. And I believe Patrick Lee Firmer is of kind of a upper crust type uh, background. And I don't think he would have, he would have been able to kind of rub shoulders with people the same way, you know, a function of class. Mm, no, that's so true because Laurie Lee, I think he grew up in a family of is he the second I don't youngest know. of 12, I think? It wow. was a huge, huge family. Um, and, and yeah, and he, and he says he lived in, they all kind of lived in this decrepit house. Uh-huh. They didn't have electricity at times. They didn't have, you know, all these, all these things. And, and he clearly, he feels very comfortable um, in, in these situations, but the, the most, he kind of he can slip in and out, and he, and he's very he's he, he says I think somewhere in the book that he likes in a way going to places where he doesn't have an identity, mm-hmm. and I think that helps him a lot when he's interacting with people because he kind of mirrors them. He doesn't have his own identity, so he can very well he can fit 
in with whatever whichever group he, he he finds himself at that moment he kind of he, he listens and he observes and that I think people love mm-hmm. people love that you know wherever if you're in Spain or in London if if you've got someone who listens to you um and I I think I think that's what he does very well right and I think it's a sentiment that many like solo travelers might understand like yes. when, when you travel somewhere alone for the first time you're like all right I'm a new person I can invent my myself again <laughs> nobody knows me they don't know my past and he does you're right he mentions that several times throughout the book he's born again or born anew I think he says yes yes I wanted to to, to circle back on what you said about the work thing and because this is this is one of the the great things about this book is he takes with him his violin his fiddle and he uses that to make money, right? Street performing. <laughs> Amazing, I know. So so cool. I mean, <laughs> could could we do that now? I don't know. And I and actually a favorite part of my book of of the book, not my book, um, was actually at near the it's at the end when he it's in the oh, it's, I think the epilogue um, where he's climbing um, the Pyrenees to get back into Spain. Mm. Um, and he says, oh, I can't believe I'm doing He's something along. I'm paraphrasing. Um, but I have none of the essentials, no food, no tent, um, no extra extra clothing to keep me warm. He's in, it's in the middle of the winter in Pyrenees, in the Pyrenees, um, snow up to his knees. Um, but he says, you know, but I do have my <laughs> violin and some books. Right. That's all he had on him. Yeah. Um, and it goes just, and, and he said, I don't know, it's something along the lines of, I don't know why I chose to bring this, but it's just all I have in the world. Mm-hmm. So it just goes to show for him that is, that was all he needed. He had his books, um, his, his pen and paper as well, he had in his rucksack to, to write his poetry and that violin to, to, to earn money and to keep going. And I guess, my version of that today is my laptop. Right. <laughs> I have my laptop in my bag and that's kind of um, obviously very different, but that, that same kind of mentality of all I, all I need is what, what's in my backpack. And I think we're kind of looping back to that now where we want to strip back and just take, take what we need to, to earn money um, and carry on traveling. Mm-hmm. Stringed nomad, he was. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know. I, 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 I'm. People still still play music. I've seen people busking around the world doing it. But wow, he that was impressive. Yeah, <laughs> how he managed to do that for so long. You'd ask. Uh, you'd asked if we could do that now. And um, when I first read this book, it was a couple of years ago in the summer. So I came to it late, like you, and. I of course I, I heard his name before, but what kind of pushed me to read it was a British writer named Alastair Humphreys, who wrote a book called My Midsummer Morning, which is pretty pretty well received. And he basically follows in the footsteps of Laurie Lee, <laughs> takes a violin with him and tries to to busk around Spain and, and make money. Have you have you read this? No, I haven't. I haven't, but I've heard of Alistair Humphreys. Yeah, he does that. But I think that one of the d- differences between Laurie Lee and Alistair Humphreys is that Alistair doesn't know how to play an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> ah, slight, slight problem. <laughs> so he's learning on the go. But um, from what we understand, uh, Laurie Lee does know how to play the fiddle fairly well, but he's just never done it in the middle of the street asking people for money. So there's a lot of I guess commentary on the anxiety of performing on the street, learning new songs that village people want to hear, and um, kind of a very interesting, like anthropological account of who pays well and who doesn't pay well, and what cities pay well and what cities don't pay well. You know, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting when he says, "Yeah, a certain time of day," or um, "Yeah, a certain kind of person." Uh-huh. Will, will will just walk past some I said people in suits you know the people that have the most money are, are less likely to pay right. I think was that is that right yeah. am I remembering that right <laughs> yeah. they would just kind of hurry past um whereas it was the lower classes and surprisingly those that had less money would would sit there and watch him and and pay so yeah that was really mm-hmm. really interesting and he also that teaches him a lot and uh, 
about just being on the streets as well and meeting people because I know some that there's a scene where where someone approaches him and says hey by the way you're doing it all wrong <laughs> right, right. Um, and he kind of becomes I know this is only he's talking about the violin but it kind of becomes something about being street savvy you know and street wise he's, he's this guy that's you know hasn't left his his Cotswold village before and here he is you know being being taught how to earn money on the streets yeah <laughs> Yeah, that that is uh, quite interesting. And he he mentioned even uh, learning how to play songs that made people feel guilty, or <laughs> like I, I guess like sad songs or saw songs that were introspective or, or something. But certain types of songs would would uh, arouse a certain uh, a certain generosity in, in 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 men who had something I don't know they felt guilty about, and they would toss a few pennies into the into the hat. Yeah, he really took this job very seriously. <laughs> he he looked at his target audience well. <laughs> yeah. So another thing that was interesting is, um, you know, the the reasons why when he was in London he decided to go to Spain. He was at uh, I think he was on a construction job, and it was coming to the e- to an end, and he was on top of the roof, and he recounts just kind of looking around you know, the horizon and saying, I can go anywhere when this job is done. I can go to Italy. I can go to Greece. I can go to France. I can go anywhere, but I'm going to go to Spain. Why? (laughs) Because he knew how to say, may I please have a glass of water in Spanish? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, (laughs) do we buy that? Do we buy that? I don't know. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, it's he and Laurie Lee knows he he knows how to make Mm -hmm. you know people laugh in that way. He knows that's gonna gonna kind of keep you going. Surely not. That's all you know, and that's why why you're choosing it. Um, But I think I I have a hunch that there was something that drew him to Spain. He's obviously because because he takes to it so quickly. I feel like there is. that draw somewhere. I, I, mm-hmm. I think there must be more than more than that. But um, yeah, it's so interesting that that he, he says he just he's just going to go there because he knows that one line. <laughs> um, there, but actually, that line does become quite important because he's thirsty pretty much throughout. Right. <laughs> so and he goes. Um, he goes in the summer. Um, that, he goes to Spain. And- I wonder if he thought about that about that afterwards. But definitely, I mean, the Brits. They love Spain anyway, so um, I think I think he wanted to go there for a while. Right. No, well, let's talk. Well, two points here. Um, he goes to Spain in in summer, which uh, we both know is is not always pleasant, especially when you're walking through the uh, meseta in the, in the middle of Spain. Especially, you go down into the south of Spain; it gets quite warm. Um, so that phrase is very important to him. But also, this point that you'd made that. Spain is very, I guess, sp- special for the British. I wonder, I wonder if we could uh, talk about that. Like, um, stereotypically, from my perspective, I, I seem to think that British have this, you know, this fantasy about Spain, about the beach, about the sun, about the warmth. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think if if you asked my grandparents on my on my British side and my mum's side, they're, they're, they're from, from the UK, who would have visited Spain, let's say, for the first time in the 80s, um, they, they, they would say there was something quite exotic about visiting Spain, you know, particularly in the south of Spain, you've got the Moorish influence in the architecture, in the food, in the dance. You've got the intense heat as you, as you mentioned, and a summer that lasts six, sometimes seven months now with, um, with global warming. Um, that, and then that dry desert like landscape in the South. So it's so different to the UK, which is green, wet, uh, cold. Um, yet you can get there in two hours on a plane or, or walk there as Laurie Lee take, it would take <laughs> right. a little bit longer, but it is, relatively close yeah it feels like a whole different world and obviously in the in the 80s 70s 70s 80s 90s Spain was still um quite poor right um it was still struggling you can um uh, financially economically compared to the UK so I think there was kind of this it it 
it was it was close to home, but it, it felt like a like a like a different world. Um, and I think there is kind of Spain has been exoticized um, by by British people, and of course, I mean we, we live we live in a country where it rains right. a lot, <laughs> so that that's that's going to be a key a key selling point. Right. But yeah, I think that continues to be. Um, an intoxicating allure for Brits to go to go to Spain, and for me, I'm half Spanish, so, and I, I grew up in Spain. I was there till I was ten years old. I was born in the Canary Islands, but I then I, I, my mum and I moved to to mainland Spain when I was three years old, and we stayed there till I was ten. So I've I've never seen Spain as this exotic spe- right. place. I just saw it as Spain. Right. Um, so it's quite, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's quite unusual to hear my parents speak of it in that my grandparents, sorry, or other people in the UK, um, particularly the older generation speak of it in that way. Right. I wonder if there is an analog here with the United States and their infatuation with maybe the Caribbean or Mexico yeah. or Cancun as, you know, place to get away, the place that it's cheap, the place that it's kind of different, not too far, a uh, place to go on holiday to, to forget about the worries. I feel like Spain, southern France, portions of Italy have that, and Greece have that same kind of connotation to it. And you're right, like my mom is, my mom is Dominican of Spanish descent, and I never grew up there, but of course she lives there now, and we go visit her, and we have family there, and you know, to, to have people or to hear people, Americans talk about the Domin- Dominican Republic um, in this kind of exotic way kind of makes me turn my head a little bit because for me, it's, it's you know, it's kind of not home, but it's where my family live, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, different. it's just the Dominican Republic for you. It's not, yeah, that's it's interesting. It is, it is a strange, a strange kind of tug and yeah, push and pull, you know, because you, you don't know, you kind of, you understand both sides because you, you've experienced mm-hmm. both. Yeah, but Laurie Lee mentions uh, towards the end of the book, somewhere in the end of the book, um, so this is the problem, I guess, in his story happening in the 30s and then writing it in the 60s is we don't know, you know, what idea belongs to what time period, but he had mentioned that in the story in the 30s that when he was growing up he had kind of like a fantasy of walking through an orange grove you know on a dirt road and going into Seville right it's like there's this fantasy mm. or this kind of cliche about Spain that also propelled him there that also brought him there so i don't know if that's a fantasy from the 30s or a fantasy from the 60s uh, but if it's from the 30 then if it's from the 30s then you know, what we're saying about the, the, the allure of Spain must have been a thing for British back then as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's interesting to see how just how how far how far back it is. And obviously in the 30s, um, there wasn't that much to what well, barely and I think uh, Lee, Laurie Lee says, you know, I was one of the few few travelers here, foreign travelers. Um, and it wasn't, I think, travel to Spain or just abroad in general didn't really um, begin to happen, I think, till the 70s in in the UK. So it was much, much later. But it's interesting that those ideas were already already forming, um, probably from the literature that, that we were reading and right. the, the programs that we were watching. That's already been embedded for, for decades. Mm-hmm. I, I did uh, some of my graduate coursework on Spain and, you know, one of the, um, I don't remember exactly where I read this, but, you know, uh, Franco uh, in the 70s had this program uh, in, from the Ministry of Tourism designed to attract British dollars, specifically to the southern coast, right? So Costa del Sol, the Mediterranean, and, you know, invested a lot of money there to attract foreign, particularly British, uh, tourists, but you're right. I think the literary tradition of people, despite Laurie Lee saying not many people went, which is probably true, but there, there were some, uh, educated, uh, British travelers and also French travelers that 
you know, wandered throughout Spain and, and, and wrote about them that certainly he would have known about, right? Gerald Brennan went to Andalusia. He went to Granada, um, spent some time there, wrote a great book um, about the region. Some of the romantic writers of the 19th century, French writers went to Spain and wrote about it. And so someone as educated and interested as in, into poetry as Laurie Lee we would assume that he would have encountered those works and those would have kind of fed the imagination about that land. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why I don't buy that um, he made the (laughs) decision on a whim um, because he knew um, the Spanish for, um, how can I, um, can I have a glass of water, please? Um, I think he'd been dreaming about those orange groves for uh, quite a while. Oh, and don't we all dream about them, man? Yes. Uh, Okay, so... um, where does this take the take us? Like for you, I just wanted to ask. Like, we're both coming to this book kind of later in life, right? Recently, I should say, we're we're both reading this within the last couple of years. Um, and I have some opinions about things, but I wanted to ask you first, like, what like works about this book in your opinion, and what doesn't doesn't work about this book? Yeah, so. It almost feels like a sin saying what doesn't work about right. Laurie Lee's work because he's such you know he's such a legend um, and but but yeah that, that I'll get I'll get on, I'll mention first what what I think works obviously mm-hmm. it, it's the language for me in 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 this book I mean he, he Laurie Lee manages to say in just under two hundred pages I think it is um, what most of us would take. I don't know, 400, 500 pages, lifetime of pages. <laughs> um, he, he's, he's so clever with his, with his use of, of language that every, every word seems to have a purpose. And I think, you know, it, it, all those details, and I've mentioned it before, you know, those fleeting moments that many of us will miss, he manages to, to capture and I think he does that best in this book in as I walked out he does it in cider with Rosie as well but particularly in this one that really shines through and I think that's why he it, he work it works so well as a travel writer um because he he captures those those small moments I also really love having grown up in Spain I think his descriptions of of food and and more, but more more specifically the bars in madrid and seville on, where he goes it? in to take shelter um from the heat um you know those descript- descriptions of sizzling hot prawns and giant um um uh, squid rings calamares you know yeah. um it, that to me even though he's writing from a very different time period a very different spain to what i where i grew up it's it it still feels familiar it feels familiar to the spain that i grew up in and that's that's quite something and i think that for me because spain basically it, it, spain is lots of things but to me spain is is food yeah. and and that's that's what i remember as a child it's the the images of people eating and drinking and having building those connections with family and friends around the table and that's how Laurie Lee finds a lot of his connections through food and through drink in these bars um and that that kind of reminded me of of the Spain that, that I remembered in when I grew up there in the 90s early 2000s so so yeah that that I really enjoyed even though he's talking about a Spain on the brink of civil war there is still something there that that continues to this day um, but then on, on the flip side, what should we talk? Do you want to talk about that first or should I go on straight on to what I don't, what I didn't like? What works for me is basically what works for you. The, the language is sharp yeah. and precise. And I love what you said about the, the descriptions of the bars. Like I, I, I remember highlighting the part where he talks about the dusty bottles hanging. <laughs> I mean, that's like spot yes. on and it, yeah. it's amazing how, how much hasn't changed. But for me also, um, what worked, and this is a f- function of the language as well, but is is the pacing, you know, it's mm. uh, well paced. I mean, 
as you as you mentioned, it's 200 pages, around 200 pages, and it's a two years condensed in 200 pages, and it just skips along. And there's no dry asides. There's nothing unnecessary. The language is so precise and moves so forward that you can't put the book down. Mm. Yeah, it's so impressive. I just think about the times where I've got to write a 2000 word article about a five day <laughs> hike I did in Mexico and I struggle, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I think, and I, then I read these pages and I think he, he just does it so effortlessly. It doesn't feel like you, he's rushing right. either. Right. That's the skill. He, it's, you think, oh, you know, he's got to, he wants to keep the, the, the story brief and to the point. So you might feel like you're rushing and skipping over things, but it doesn't because every word is so rich that um, it, it, he makes it work. And that's why he's, he's the great writer that he is, I guess. Right. He, makes it, he makes it look easy and effortless. And I think that's, yeah, that's the mark of skill. Yeah. What about um, perhaps some of the things that didn't sit well with you? Yeah. And I think that's a better way to put it actually, Jeremy saying what didn't sit well rather than what doesn't work. Um, because I think what, I'm about to say is probably more of a uh, represents probably more his time rather than um, what him, him as a writer, I don't know, but his representation of women and you've touched, touched upon on that at the beginning, but um, that made me feel uh, obviously as a woman reading this um, in the 21st century, uh, that obviously doesn't align with the, the view I have of women. Right. Um, women are very much present in all of Lee's work. He clearly loves women very much, <laughs> um, but their roles are very one dimensional. I think there are essentially two types of women in, in Lee's book. One is, is the prostitute and two is this very kind of pious housewife caring for her husband. And it's clear, you know, that what Lee finds sexual gratification from women, he kind of seeks comfort and solace in women. But when it comes to needing friendship or a mentor or a guide or someone to confide in, he always, he always turns to men. Um, there's never this woman that he even, he just sits down and talks to. They're very much a commodity. Right. Um, and that, that grinded on me um after a while but of course it is it's this is a different time period um one example that really shocked me um was a scene at the end of the Valladolid chapter where um Lee walks in on a woman beating up her husband because right. he was trying to we don't know whether it was rape their young daughter or just sexually abuse or another form of sexually sexual abuse but that i mean that in itself is incredibly shocking and he just kind of mentions it very very quickly right um and then moves on um but the most shocking part is that instead of comforting the woman or the child who's just been abused the young girl lee comforts the man right I mean, he carries him to the bedroom. He washes he washes his face. Um, so he's all he's all bloody, um, and he covers with him a co uh, covers him with with a coat, and yeah, he, he he puts him to to bed as if he's almost mothering him, and and he just kind of reflects on the misery and injustice of the world, and that that was shocking to me. I I, I couldn't I couldn't get over that bit. Right. No, I read that as definitely. I read that as um, a, a rape, where the father is trying to yeah. rape the daughter. I mean, I think uh, mm. I think that's the way to read that. Um, when I was reading this, I noticed that he was uh, kind of representing a, a Spanish, a Spaniard in a certain way, either man or woman, man or woman. Um, he's exoticizing them. He's you know, he, he even mentions that, that they're Arab faces and they're red and savage mouths, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he writes about men in, in, in this very kind of like drunken or violent state. And at women, as you mentioned, either in kind of like a motherly way or also a very pious and religious uh, way. Mm -hmm. So there's these like kind of broad strokes of the brush here and stereotyping kind of the exotic Spanish character in a way that... Um, 
might be a function of the time, but certainly doesn't sit well uh, when you're reading it in 2021. Mm, definitely, definitely. It's yeah, that was that was that was pretty pretty shocking to me. Um, I mean, I, you know, I can't you kind of you expect women to be um, to not be this central character if it's a man walking through Spain <laughs> in the Civil War in the 30s. Right. You know, you you I, you know, I'm not naive, and I thought, oh, there's going to be this, you know, heroine here <laughs> saving the day, um, but it was it was just this real disregard and the way he kind of it was always about um a kind of this comradeship but just amongst men and when when this rape takes part mm-hmm. takes place the the way he he just kind of he turns immediately to help the man yeah. and that was yeah that was quite i didn't think about um, that before that stayed yeah but, did you not see it like that no well i mean now that you mentioned that yeah that's it's it's shocking but i that that part didn't cross my mind. I think that might just be a function function of me being a man than anything. Um, mm. I, I thought I thought of it was oh here's uh, another scene depicting kind of the Spanish the savage Spanish character the violent incestuous drunken Spaniard. Um, mm. But now that you mention that, you're right. It's it's fucked up. <laughs> that- <laughs> it's, it's exactly that. It's so fucked up. And that is, that is the truth because I, I, that's interesting that you say that because my boyfriend read it and he, and he said the same. He went, well, I think he's, yeah, he said the same. He didn't really notice that he went immediately to the man. Um, but I think, yeah, as a woman reading that immediately, my instinct was to go over to the mother and give her a big hug, you right, know, right. and and tell her it's going to be okay. <laughs> And that, yeah, that just, yeah. that just really, I, I, it's been on my mind um, for the last, for the last year, Jeremy, <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, um, it's good to talk it out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I promise not to keep you for too long and we've been just chatting away. Um, I know it's gone so quick. <laughs> it's gone so quick. I haven't had a chat about a book like this since I was at university. So it's, it's lovely. Yeah, it's so it's nice. Good. Um, well, um, let's kind of wrap this up here. I don't want to give away the ending. And in my in my opinion, like the ending is just fantastic. As you mentioned earlier, he goes, he leaves Spain because of the Civil War, but he returns to Spain um, in the middle of winter and he's crossing the Pyrenees with his violin again. Um, but I thought the <laughs> end was just fantastic, kind of cliffhanging, uh, cliffhanger of, a, of an ending that wants me to read more. Mm, I don't know if you felt yeah. that way too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, and, and I was quite not nervous, but, um, yeah, I didn't know how I would have ended this book. Um, I was kind of hesitant to, to get to the end to see how he was going to, he was going to finish this. Um, but that kind of dot, dot, dot it, and I don't normally like these dot, dot, dot endings. Cause I always think, oh, okay. Like this <laughs> feels buy the like, other one. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I want it feels like kind of Netflix, you know, <laughs> see uh, episode where you have to watch the other one, even though it's 3 a.m. in the morning. But but it works. It does work really well in, in this one. And I haven't read the next book, but I will. I have ordered it. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking Good. forward to reading that. I think there's a, a lesson here in, in terms of uh, writing a book like this um, that, that I learned. And you know, the way that his narrative isn't so rigid to the chronology, like he's, you know, again, this is like two years condensed into 200 pages and he doesn't care about lapses or gaps in time. It's just, he doesn't try to justify it. He just moves the narrative along. And, you know, I think there's something there, like, I don't know about you when I'm writing them, I tend to try to fill in the gaps. Do you know what I mean? Does, is that making any sense? Yeah. Like yeah. It's so true. And you, and you feel as if the reader won't understand what you're, right. what you mean, exactly. or like the reader won't, won't have caught up with where you are in your storyline. Um, that's so true. And I think that's, that's kind of a sign of just a very confident writer, someone who's just writing because he, wa- that's the way he wants to write. And that, that takes a lot of confidence. 
um, and he, he does have almost annoying amount, annoying amounts of confidence, or verging on cocky, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he's quite, he's so, so confident. At least he comes across it in, in the book. And I think he almost has, you can tell he has, has that same confidence that he does kind of walking through Spain as he does writing. It's, it's, I wish I could write like that. <laughs> I wish I had that confidence. It's, it's, um, yeah, really, really powerful. Yeah. Ditto there. I think that's a good, good place to, to end this talk. So I re- look, I really enjoyed chatting with you about, uh, his book and, and it was just fun. And, Close us out. Let us know. Remind us again where we can find you on Instagram. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at nomada tra- dot travel. That's nomada n o m a d a nomada travel. Um, I also have a website. It's Jessica G Vincent at um, no, that's not at outlook dot com. That's my email. <laughs> um, Jessica G Vincent dot com. That's my um, yeah my website where you, you can see my work on there and get in touch if, if you have any questions. Great. I'll put those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on. Great. Thanks so much, Jeremy. You can find the episode show notes and much more at TravelWritingWorld.com. Please remember to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app. And if you find the show valuable, please consider leaving a review or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month at travelwritingworld.com slash support.